well, this is about creating spaces, um, the challenge perceptions. And I'm talking directly about the perception of space, and I will get to that. And we'll talk about two-dimensional and three-dimensional uh, experience. So I'm going to start with two questions. The first of them is, is this image comfortable, and can you read it anyway? Raise your hand if you can read it anyway. OK. Is it comfortable? Yeah, OK. Um, it does take a little more cognitive work. How about this one? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's one difference between graphic uh, representation and architectural one. And one of the ways to depict that is to talk about artistic tension. And artistic tension can be easily defined in two-dimensional work. My prop is here. In two-dimensional work, artistic tension is this. And you can't do this. And that's why the tension remains. And painters use this a lot to create surfaces that you want to look at. In architecture, there's a difference. I can do this. And if it's like this, I can do that. And one of the things that architects do with something that can be represented two-dimensionally, inaccurately in the case of architecture, is to use movement. And architects use design to induce movement. So I'm going to use another term that I want to define first, cognitive closure, which is the end of a sequence. First, there's sensation. Then some stuff in here does something called perception, which is filtering and organizing data. And then the rest of the brain gets to do something called cognition, which is the aha part where you say, I know what it is. This happens less than a millisecond at a time, unless it's complicated, in which case it can take more than a millisecond. And I'd say that's a characteristic of artis artistic tension. How's this? A little better? OK. Because it's centered. So perhaps, uh, uh, well, let me just say briefly what I teach. It's called Beauty and Brains, and it was just introduced. But it's taught to graduate students in architecture who have already been, let's say, inculcated um, with the idea that when you design, you design looking down. You do plans. You do ideas. And I'll show you a few. But in fact, architectural experience is three-dimensional. It involves time and movement. It involves context. How do you understand that? Well, there's some people who helped me begin to understand it. One of them was E.H. Gombrich, a psychology of art, a psychologist of art, um, and another, uh, actually German philosopher, uh, Rudolf Arnheim, who wrote the architecture, the dynamics of architectural experience. So let's start with the two-dimensional stuff. Okay, so familiar with the one on the left? Okay, you may not be familiar with the one on the right, but that is an, exist an example of artistic tension that I can't resolve right now. But cinematographers love to use this. And I'll talk a little bit more about the proportion of how they see things and how we see things. So a couple examples of what architects do. Some of these are local. The top two are local. The bottom two aren't. And one of the things that I think is important is to know something about how architects think about form in terms of symmetry. Symmetry is an abiding characteristic of classical architecture, but also about modern architecture. And in the case of classical up there, a uh, beautiful building here in DC, Jefferson Memorial, it is exactly bilaterally symmetrical, two axes. But it's not the same in these axes, in the opposite axis. The one on the right has some bilateral symmetry, but it violates it, and that creates part of the tension there. And the bottom two, although they're geometrically complex, have underpinnings which are geometrically not complex. Sometimes things are a little bit literal. Um, I don't know if these folks manufacture baskets or not, but they might. Uh, Corbusier's uh, chaplet Ronchamp on the upper right has been thought to be his conception of a nun's hat. He would never say so. The one on the bottom literally is a church that points to heaven. So we can think about things in terms of image. We can think about them in terms of form. Again, looking down on them and coming up with plan ideas. But we can also talk about other ways to think about geometric tension. Frank Gehry's house on the upper left, which was done way before the two on the bottom, um, has, a, has a continuity, believe it or not. And the continuity is that the ones on the bottom involve complex forms that are not intended to resolve. So the artistic tension is high. The cognitive closure is low. So another trick that architects use is called the three-level plan, or the three-level building bottom, middle, and top. Cognitively, this is really important and really interesting because your cone of vision is down here. To look up there is harder. 
To look up at the top is harder unless you're looking at a skyline. So the profile of a city is literally a skyline, and architects and cognitive folks call that a contour. So down here, we have bottom, middle, and top. Here, we have bottom, bottom middle, of top, and top, which is really a retail segment. The shaft, which is the office segment. Your eye is slowed by the first cornice and stopped by the top. Even the classical Seagram building there by Mies van der Rohe um, has a bottom, middle, and a top. The ones on the right don't. One of the characters, uh, characteristics of modern architecture that people sometimes don't like is the lack of being able to be rooted in the experience, and the bottom, middle, and top is something that helps. So here's an example of how a pretty good architect named Mayim Pei started with a sketch that's called a partie. And a partie is, geometric, is a geometric examination that's not just doodling, it also has to do with meaning. So on the left is the sketch on which that building is based. Now, if you look at the sketch on the left, you can see there's an outline that's a trapezoid around those forms. That's the shape of the site. But within it, you can see a center line that comes down this way. The bottom rectangle is the original National Gallery of Art. So what he's done is create a center line, which exists over there in the form, and then broaden, as you move out of the triangle, out of the, into the trapezoid, a more complex form. So it goes from the more static, classical organization to a more dynamic, modern organization, hence its purpose in art. We also do sketches. We go around, and one of the things that we look for is the partie of the buildings we're seeing. So architects know how to think that way, but do we tend to limit our thinking by starting with a partie as, in, as opposed to starting with experience? Here's a case of parties being used for uh, the development of a building which involves sacred and secular elements. The left side, Catholic faith, God's kingdom, etc., soft feminine edges, and on the right, academia, the world around us, regular and mathematical proportions. Well, what happens in these diagrams is that as they move together and move apart, the form of a building actually emerges. And if you can imagine those lines just being translated upwards into walls, you start to see or you see the starting of a, uh, of a thought process. But again, it's, only a, it's not really about experience. Some parties get people into trouble, um, and that's why God invented erasers. <laughs> so now let's move literally into beauty and brains, and here's the brain part. Um, so we're going to see some examples of partie, how it, how it applies, but also about geometry. And my theory is, or actually my hypothesis here, is that all the things that I've been talking about actually have a cognitive basis, and that that basis was established under uh, evolutionary circumstances and pressures. They're survival-based. But today, instead of facing a saber-toothed tiger, we face other figures, that is, the things that we attend to. But we have the same cognitive and neural mechanisms to address that. So. Um, I was aware from my training that uh, there's a strong relationship between proportion and architecture. I think people are not surprised by that. But I wondered how proportional systems often seem to achieve beauty. And I was intrigued by the lesser examples, as well as the greater examples, they're arguably more beautiful, more perfect in some way. And we'll talk about what that some way is. And the question is, is this a matter of taste or an underlying broader base in which taste is a small component and agreement is a much, much, much bigger component. Okay, So down below, we see something that has evolved um, and is a better thing to look at than the one on top. Why is that? It happens that the proportional system was evolving. When people talk about Greek architecture, we frequently talk about the golden section, which is a ratio, a geometric ratio, that can be constructed out of basic platonic shapes. Um, the mathematics of it are intriguing, and the mathematics are, have been elaborated so that people believe that they have almost mystic qualities. In fact, the Pythagoreans, who were the guardians of this, would punish those who revealed the secret of the golden section. They would kill them. Okay. So here are some of those proportional systems starting to be overlaid. You can see that those lines around this one, but more dramatically here. And those diagrams show a way of organizing the facade. Is it credible? 
which came first, the evolved Greek temple or the golden section? Well, the golden section has been used for lots of things, and here we get into, I think, the religion of the golden section to talk about things like pine cones, which are, in fact, interesting geometrically. They are a symmetry that involves rotation, dilation, and vertical extension as it grows. That's the morphology of a, of a pine cone. And people have compared that to the golden section. So here are some other examples. And the application to the Venus de Milo is there. Um, some people think that it is based on that. I would suggest that her knee doesn't fit. Um, and I wonder what it is that makes us react to that in this way. So let's talk about her for a minute. Um, it's very broadly admired as beautiful. I think it's compared, it's in the same category as the Mona Lisa, the Parthenon, and the Taj Mahal. People think of it at that level and should. It has magic and it's studied. And the question is, is it really the product of applied mathematics? And we have to ask from what the beauty is arising. Is it the undersized head, proportionately, or the revert, reverted tilt of the shoulders and hips, one up, one down, that makes it more dynamic? Or the tease of what's covered but nearly falling off and what's not? And is the overall sensuality that is clearly not mathematical guiding our reactions? Well, architects like proportional systems. There's a payoff. When you use a proportional system, everything relates to everything else, and that creates something we call harmony. So here's the application. Leonardo, who I would call an architect, um, and Le Corbusier, who everybody calls an architect, but also a painter. And you can see that there are lines connecting the two. Le Corbusier's system, called the modular, and that's the modular man, defined everything from the height of a person to the height of a countertop to where a doorknob ought to be. Everything was based on the Fibonacci series, which is related strongly to the golden section. So the reality is that nobody's perfect, including Venus. So here's the, here are us. And I think one of the things that we need to know is that if these systems are intended to describe what puts us together and how we are, clearly they don't succeed. Well, maybe they almost succeed. There are examples that are more <laughs> successful. All right, so now let's take the golden section for a minute in the upper right corner. That's the geometric construction of it. And let's overlay it on the Parthenon. So which came first? This is a chicken and egg question. There is the rectangle. On the right is the rectangle with two circles inscribed in it that overlap. Guess what else is a good case of that? The orbit of two eyes or two circles that overlap. It happens they fit nicely into the golden section. It also happens that in World War II, in the design of periscope viewing screens, there was a lot of experimentation about what that shape ought to be. And the shape that was found to be the most pleasing, that is the most comfortable, and I think those two words are related, was the golden section. And so my point is the golden section seems to fit us rather than us fitting into the Parthenon. So we look out at the world through the golden section. So in fact, it's not what we're looking at. It's how it comes into our brains. Now think about movies. The typical movie screen is not the golden section. It's the golden section with some extensions. Why? Because our heads do this. But the center of vision, the image in that, section, in, that, in that screen, is always a golden section piece. And I encourage you to take a look at that. So is beauty in the eye of the beholder? Well, it seems that it's actually in two eyes. And is it really something that is physiological, evolutionary, or is it uh, something that is just happenstance? I certainly don't think it's happenstance. So let's take a look at how architects get taught some of these things. The Bauhaus, these were the guys who were classically trained. They were all Beaux-Arts and classical architects who said, no more of this, this gingerbread stuff. And it seems like they discarded stuff. But in fact, what they did is they looked for the essence. And they tried to teach their students the essence. And all these guys were pretty good at it. So they did exercises like this. Johannes Itten, who's done color theory and also did this kind of theory, developed exercises that were abstractions. Why abstractions? because you go to the core of how perception and organization of shapes work. The other reason is brutal. Architects in their freshman courses are trying, the, the idea is to try to dislodge them from their aesthetic assumptions. 
and basic design courses like this tend to do it. So one of the things that's taught is something called figure ground. In graphic terms, figure ground is a balance or a relationship of black and white surface. One of the classic things that people do is something called figure ground reversals, and I'll show you one now. When I started teaching freshmen, my reaction was, I don't understand why we're learning this. And through the frustration of trying to discover the answer, I came across Gombrich and Arnheim, who opened the door. So here's one. I'm sorry, that's an exercise. This is one of the people who picked up on this, a fellow named Escher, who has a transition here between figure and ground that becomes a different figure as it transitions. This is a very high-level version of that exercise. Here's another one. This is probably familiar to most of you, the face vase illusion. What I'm asking you to do right now, though, is to look at it. Who sees the face? Raise your hand, please. OK, who sees the vase? Raise your hand, please. Who sees the two of them at the same time? You're all liars. <laughs> Try it again. Can you really see them simultaneously? Because the brain really looks for cog cognitive results, and it moves from one to the other. And this is called an ambiguous figure, because it contains multiple meanings. And an ambiguous figure um, is a good window into how the brain works, and it's a good window into where the brain slips, because it makes a leap. Without sufficient information or with contradictory information, it chooses an outcome, which turns out to be a good survival strategy. You have to decide quickly whether it's a saber-toothed tiger or not. This is another famous one. This is the old lady, young lady illusion. Who sees the old lady? OK. Who sees the young lady? OK. Who sees both? OK. It's not easy. Who sees them at the same time? Who's going to lie? One person. Okay. This is a different kind of, of ambiguous figure. Uh, when I visited it and, and took that picture, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out why it was so captivating, why people go back to it. It's quite beautiful, obviously. But what is so alluring and difficult about it that it captures us a lot? For me, the answer turned out to be a little revelation. I don't know if it's true. And for me, it was that it is light and heavy at the same time. It's obviously a huge mass of stone obviously heavy. At the same time, it glows and it's light. Those two things don't click. And we look at it looking for cognitive uh, closure that does not come. Here's another ambiguous figure. OK, so architecture typically involves multiple figures. And what I discovered through the graphic stuff was that, in fact, figure ground is different in architecture than these abstractions. The guy up there is figure. The second thing might be either reading the profile of the, of the wall or the squares in the wall. The example on the right is a complex composition that starts with a bilaterally symmetrical piece and then creates tensions, which makes you look at it longer. It doesn't resolve. Okay? The other thing is how the brain takes in information about what figure is. Figure is critical for survival. So here's a scene. Somebody took a picture. And look, there's a little sculpture on top of that wall. But the, what, the, what the brain sees is the image on the right, on the lower right. And that's why I tell the photo lenses work. OK, on the upper left, somebody's holding up a towel. The figure is behind that towel. That face is the figure. That's called layering in architecture and in lots of other media. The reason it's significant is that it opaques. It makes it hard to see the figure. The more permeable that screen, the more you see the figure. These are other examples of how architects use permeable um, layering to create depth. Another fascinating uh, idea, I think, is something called refuge and prospect. And that is an idea that is clearly survival-oriented, uh, where you see out into the distance, you see the whole horizon, you can see the saber-toothed tiger out there, or you can see a food source. But you're in a, you're in a protected environment, usually lifted up. Frank Lloyd Wright and Le Corbusier here masterfully used something that they didn't know the name of. They were just that good. Okay. Last couple slides. This one talks about an organization that just lets you know that, that I'm not the only guy who's thinking about the relationship between neuroscience, cognition, and architectural experience. This is the institute. Actually, it's, it's something that, uh, that some of the people in this room already know about. The Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture, a professor from Catholic U here named Julio Bermudez, has presented there uh, looking at fMRI studies of how people experience spaces that are for meditation and spiritual purposes. Architecture has found a link that is going to be terrifically productive in understanding 
how we really experience the world that we're in. Here's a little article. Neuroscience says buildings can reshape our brains. Maybe our brains can reshape our architectural experiences and teach architects to design in a way that understands these spatial dynamics, doesn't start with a plan looking down, but looks at the actual formal experience of being in space, the complicated spaces we really live in. Thank you.